important webinar in the lead up to this year's World Tuberculosis Day, which will be observed globally on 24th of March. The theme of World TB Day 2018 is Wanted Leaders for a TB Free World Make History and TB. This is a critical theme given the political importance of the upcoming UN General Assembly high level meeting on TB later this year in September, which will bring together heads of states in New York. It follows on from the very successful WHO Global Ministerial Conference on Ending TB held in Moscow in November 2017 that resulted in high level commitments from ministries and other leaders from 120 countries to accelerate progress to end TB. The Moscow Declaration endorsed by governments committed to develop a multi-sectoral accountability framework, so critically important indeed. 2018 could be a game-changing year for not only accelerating work towards ending TB, but also advancing progress on other promises of sustainable development. In today's webinar, among the panelists, we have Dr. Mario Rabiglion, who was among the key people who spearheaded the organizing of the Moscow conference. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsuru. Ashok Ramsuru is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was senior producer at the South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Greetings from Durban, South Africa. Let me begin with a good, positive, and promising news. Governments of our countries have committed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, by 2030. And one of these goals is to end TB by 2030. Also, WHO NTB strategy received full support of our governments in World Health Assembly in May 2014. And most importantly, our ministers of health and other ministers who were part of WHO Global Ministerial Conference in Moscow acknowledge that despite concerted efforts, TB, including its drug resistant forms, causes more deaths than any other infectious disease worldwide and is a serious threat to global health security. If we are to end TB, we need multi-sectoral action and for effective action we need multi-sectoral accountability. Let me introduce our distinguished panelist today. Dr. Mario Ravigli Orne who was one of the key architects and visionaries which resulted in the first ever WHO Global Ministerial Conference last November. He was the then director of WHO Global Tuberculosis Program and now is the director of Global Health Center at the University of Milan. For your edification, Dr. Ravi Gli One will be taken well, we'll be leaving immediately after his presentation as he will leave because he has to catch a train. Following thereafter will be Ms. Baidi Mayo Magaya, who is the country director, oh, sorry, who is the communications officer at the Union Zimbabwe. And finally, Dr. Zolelwa Sifumba, TB survivor and management committee member of TB Proof. South Africa. Before we listen to our first panelist shortly, let me request you all to keep sending your question either by using the chat function or raising virtual hand of the webinar too. Keep sending the questions while panelists present. Well, it's over to you, Dr. Mario. I would like I would like to interrupt a little bit here before Mario begins. We will yes. request the participants to please send the questions for Mario, ask them right after his presentation, since he may not remain with us till the end of the webinar. So this is for the participants to note. Yes, over to you, Mario, now. Thank you very much, uh, Shoba. Thank you, all of you, 
organizers for inviting me. I suppose you can hear me well. Can you just confirm? Yes, yes, yes we yes. can hear you very well, Mark. Perfect. And you can see the screen. Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. So, what I intend to do, if uh, if uh, the screen works, give me a second. Yes, is to exactly do the following. Uh, looking at uh, the fact that the interventions have been successful so far to revert the previous trends of tuberculosis, but not enough. That uh, the soft and political and financial commitments, in my view, are those that prevent nowadays faster progress. That it is plenty of good declarations, but no significant accountability. And ending tuberculosis, in my view, will require a multi-sectoral response that starts within health but goes beyond health and particularly underline a clear accountability mechanism. That having been said, let me just go very quickly. These are the global strategies that have been uh, uh, promoted by the World Health Organization over the past 20 plus years. We started with the DOT strategy at the time. We uh, uh, re reformulated it in 2006 to widen it, to enhance it in what is called, uh, what was called the stop TV strategy because we had to stop tuberculosis. But then we uh, ended up in 2014 having approved by the World Health Assembly, meaning the ministers of health of the old world, this new strategy, which is now called NTV strategy, and that is in principle. Uh, starting to be implemented and started in fact in 2006 being implemented in the era of the sustainable development goals. Now let me just go very quickly through the burden. First of all, the results of the implementation of the strategies are shown in this slide. On the left you have the incidence and on the right you have the death. And what you see over there is uh, the fact that there was a peak in incidence and the peak in deaths in the early or mid 2000s after which both incidents and deaths came down. The problem is that the incidence is coming down at only 2% per year, and the rate uh, of mortality is coming down only at 3% per year, when we would need a much uh, uh, higher level of, uh, of descent, the, the, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, reduction trend in order to achieve the international target that had been set. Now, let me just go quickly through the latest global TB report that summarizes the situation in the world. As I mentioned, progress, 53 million lives have been saved in the period of the millennium development laws between 2000 and 2016 with uh, TB deaths that fell by 22%. So these are major achievements. At the same time, at the same time, still 1.7 million people, including 400,000 among people living with HIV, are dying of tuberculosis every every year, which means nearly 5,000 every day. MDRTB is at a crisis level, especially in, few, in a few countries, especially in the former Soviet countries, but in, in terms of numbers in India and in China and in Russia, this is where the burden is. And finally, there is a, a pretty uh, huge gap in financial terms with some $2.3 billion missing last year and uh, uh, additionally 1.2 billion for research, which I believe is not adequate because the global plan to stop TB only foresees $2 billion for research necessary every year. When I see that in the case of AIDS, is, is about 20 times more that is being invested in research. And that is why in AIDS we have also, you know, all these many antiretrovirals and advances that we don't see so rapidly in tuberculosis. Now, who gets tuberculosis? I'm going to the multi-sectoriality now and the multidisciplinary approach. Well, the most vulnerable people. On the left, you have a poor family, family in Peru. The boy was sick. You are sure that also some of these kids are infected now. And just there to, uh, to, 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 to develop tuberculosis when they get some of these risk factors, such as HIV, malnutrition, alcohol, or drug abuse, smoking, diabetes. Women and children are equally heavily affected and you see that migrants refugees prisoners uh, those people belonging to ethnic minorities meaning all the marginalized all the discriminated people are the ones that suffer from tuberculosis so the approach to tuberculosis must be necessarily multidisciplinary and let me illustrate that if you know the history of tuberculosis the natural history you go from being exposed to someone who is infected you enter into a phase of latent infection. We estimate 
uh, that there are in the world nowadays about uh, 1.7 billion people infected, meaning one quarter of humanity is infected latently, and then some of them, about 10 million per year, go on to develop disease. And eventually, some of them, obviously, everyone suffer, but some of them will die unless there is proper treatment. Now, let me show to you what we can do with the health sector using the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal Framework. With, uh, with the health sector, which is incorporated into, into this SDG called number, number three, that is called Good Health and Well-Being, we can actually take care of the people with TB, and we can actually prevent, give them prophylaxis or a vaccine for infant TB that actually prevents tuberculosis. We can also address some of the risk factors that come from the medical field, which means uh, essentially HIV AIDS uh, and some of the non-communicable conditions, such as diabetes, smoking, alcohol, as I mentioned already. So with the, the, within the health sector, we can do this. However, let's look at this one. So who is actually responsible for the exposure? Well, what is responsible for that is poor living and working conditions, crowding, poor ventilation, like the family in Peru, silicosis, meaning you work in a mine and you get your lungs intoxicated by the silica, uh, um, 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 uh, the crystals and so on that are in the air. And so that is a conducive environment for transmission. You need this condition, not only, but in order to develop them actual, actual, active actual tuberculosis, uh, from latent infection, this 1.7 billion and 10 million go on, you will need something else. You need food insecurity, like malnutrition, that generates malnutrition. And you have all this discrimination and stigmatization of population that don't have access to health. How do you address all of these other factors? With about 10 other sectors. 10 other sectors incorporated into the or represented, expressed into these SDGs. Number one, no poverty. Number seven, clean energy. Number 11, sustainable city, number two, zero hunger, quality education, peace and justice, gender equality, inequalities, and so on and so forth. So the approach to tuberculosis cannot be other than a comprehensive development approach. That's why we need a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Now, uh, to, to address tuberculosis, obviously, we will need to uh, face a few challenges. Some of them, as I mentioned, are already responsibilities of the health ministry and the national TB programs, like addressing the TB cases, the MIS cases, the MDR TB as a crisis, joint TB HIV response, increasing finance, intensifying research, and then outside of TB, uh, HIV, tobacco, alcohol, diabetes, all to be controlled and universal coverage to be uh, pursued. However, what about then beyond the NTP and beyond health? And I have ju just illustrated that the sectors that deal with poverty alleviation and lack of social protection, those that deal with malnutrition, those that deal with poor living and working conditions in slums, in, minor, in mining, in prisons, and so on, those uh, other sectors that deal or that could resolve the problem of discrimination, stigma, war, migration, and finally inequities and inequalities are all crucially important. Now, we tried to address this issue when I was at the WHO with this meeting in Moscow that Shoba already mentioned. And as you see there, the vision was to end in TB in this sustainable development era using a multi-sectoral response. That's why not just ministers of health were invited, but also other ministers. Um, what is all the answer back at this point? So we seem to have, in essence, some of the, although not, nothing is perfect, and nothing is now ideal in terms of diagnosis, in terms of treatment, in terms of prevention. However, with what we have, we could do much better. So what is actually hold, holding us back? And I believe the bottlenecks are both political and financial. Let me go to them. So number one, bottleneck number one, political indifference. I wrote this paper, I co-wrote this paper in 2010, but I actually wrote what you see on the right. And if you look at it, it says essentially that the funding for TB is neglected and is still neglected with the huge gap I illustrated because it is not TB, a special program of the bank. It is not a main priority among any UN agency leaders, including WHO. I've never seen a WHO director general that said TB is my priority. Uh, because, of course, there are many other priorities. We understand that. But that is the case. That is the situation. It's not in UNICEF portfolio. It's not, not a special presidential initiative for the U.S. It does not have a strong support from the pharmaceutical industry. So there is political indifference that we have to solve. 
bottleneck number two I mentioned already is the financial inadequacies. And you see that in 2017, the debt was about 2.2 billion, but if the trend remains the same, so many very slow increasing in financing, by 2020, the global plan of the stock to be punished was estimated that there will be a, about $5 billion gap. And not only that, but as I mentioned already, there is this huge problem with uh, with research. I do not believe that $2 billion is the good uh, ideal target. It should be 10 times more if we really want to accelerate with the development of those new tools that will be conducive to elimination. Now, some visibility is coming. Some visibility came in the past uh, year or so. The G20 in Germany spoke about TB and associated it with antimicrobial resistance. Vietnam, at the APEC uh, uh, forum in 2017, prioritized tuberculosis. The G7 in Italy reiterated the commitment of the G20 to address tuberculosis. That was the Moscow conference I mentioned already. Now, this year, there will be the APEC in Canada. Hopefully, there will be enough pressure from communities in such a way that Canada adopts tuberculosis in the agenda. And finally, in September, there is the uh, famous high-level meeting on tuberculosis that is, I believe, now scheduled on the 26th. Just very quickly, there, there is top-level uh, uh, political commitment at this time for, you know, I would say, one of the first times in history that you had within a few months Mr. Putin in the case of Russia. This is the Deputy Secretary General that also came to open the Moscow meeting in November. And last week I hear there was Mr. Modi that spoke about the uh, commitment to fight tuberculosis. Um, but, you know, what th this commitment comes to in the end is what we are uh, trying to uh, uh, address. Now, the Moscow conference defined three major outcomes that we are in the advancing the response via universal coverage, ensuring sufficient and sustainable financing, and addressing research. However, if you ask me what was the most important decision there, by far, this is the decision of going on with the multisectoral accountability framework. A multi sectoral accountability framework, which uh, is now being, uh, in a way, conceived. And uh, this is, for instance, what my former colleagues at WHO have been producing, asking the question really who is accountable, what commitment are accountable, to whom is one accountable, and how is one held into account. And you see here the cycle, the cycle between uh, the cycle between uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 um, sorry for my phone, uh, the cycle between uh, the commitments and then what is necessary there. So actions that are uh, uh, expression of commitment, monitoring of those, and the review in such a way that we can judge if things are going well or less well. Now, having said this, what we can say in, at the moment that there is no action uh, really or no commitment really above the World Health Assembly and no money that is backing this commitment. There is, in terms of monitoring, a good system worldwide, but not a high level, and there is no shadow report by the civil society, really. And finally, uh, in terms of review mechanism, there is no high level political review, nor there is an independent review. There is no review in any other sector that is not held, and there is no civil society review. So there is a lot of work to be done. And if I want to illustrate now a couple of points, and then I close, who is accountable? Well, the countries and the governments, everyone agrees with that. But then there is WHO there that is supposed to assist the countries and the government that is accountable. There are other UN agencies that are uh, developed, that are in other sectors of development, like ILO for labor, or UNICEF for UNDP for general development, or UNHCR and IOM for refugees and migrants, or the World Food Program and FAO for what concerns, for instance, veterinarian affairs as well as uh, nutrition. And then, after that, you have the World Bank. The question is, what is the World Bank doing nowadays for tuberculosis? And not only, there is a stock to be punished that is supposed to convene everyone. And there are a number of donors, including philanthropies like the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller, Clinton Foundation, and so on, bilateral donors like USAID or like the PEPFAR project. And there are the, of course, big financial mechanisms that cover TB, the Global Fund and Unicate. Are they accountable and to whom and how? And then you also have NGOs, and a number of them. Finally, at the bottom there, you have the so-called public-private partnerships that are those related to research. And all of them are accountable to some board or to some entity. But how we make that uh, accountable worldwide? Now, the next is which commitments uh, and actions are accountable? Well, what we have at the moment are two of them. 
One is the World Health Assembly that, uh, that approved this target that you see here, and the other is the Sustainable Development Goal of the United Nations, target 3.3, which calls to uh, end the epidemic of tuberculosis. That's what we have, and we have to build on that, but they're not high level enough, or at least they're not being taken into high level enough, hopefully uh, that will happen with the UN General Assembly. And finally, who should uh, be accountable to? And uh, the options and modalities uh, for the high level meeting on TV that will be convened in uh, September explain a bit on that, but the, the reality is that, uh, uh, importantly, the UN General Assembly, in my view, is the one that has uh, to really check and monitor what's going on. There is a need, therefore, to start measuring more than the classical uh, TB indicators that we all know, like the notification, uh, treatment success, etc. There are a bunch of indicators in health that are important, the coverage of essential health services, the prevalence of HIV, smoking, diabetes, the health expenditure per capita, etc. But there are, as I mentioned already, a number of other sectors. This is the no poverty. So many people live below the poverty line. What's the prevalence of undernourishment? What's the uh, GDP per capita? The Gini index for inequalities, and so on and so forth. All this needs to be, obviously, monitored. And a system has to be put in place. WHO already started last year monitoring these indicators. And the actions are shown on the right. The actions and the reviews, well, you know, action globally include having a good monitoring system for these operational indicators, uh, monitoring the global plan to stop TB, the GDF, the global fund, UNITAID, the World Bank, the other donors, the NGOs and civil society themselves have to be accountable. And finally, the reviews. Review, the number one, has to be taken place at UNGA, UN General Assembly, regularly. And then you can have the World Health Assembly for what concerns the health sector. The problem will be to make sure that other sectors are accountable. And I close by summarizing. Commitment is plenty, although at low level, and accountability is empty at the moment. All are accountable in all sectors. Governments, UN family agencies, donors, philanthropy, partnerships, and so on and so forth. Accountability is clear when it comes to governmental entities and UN, UN agencies, because governments respond to their people, and UN agencies respond to member states, meaning government. But it's much less so for the other entities that really need to, uh, to adhere to the system. What's necessary? An agreed upon framework at the UN General Assembly with a system that regularly monitor and reviews at the highest possible level nationally and internationally at the UN General Assembly and for what concerns health at the World Health Assembly. And finally, I see that the role of civil society and people and media, I would say, is crucial because this has been well seen in other occasions, in other diseases like HIV AIDS and other major health threats, how important the political pressure is when it comes from the people. Without civil society, without the strong pressure at national level and internationally, we will not reach what needs to be reached, i.e. an accountability mechanism that is really serious and that keep people into, uh, into control of what is going on. Without that, I think it will be business as usual. And with that, I thank you very much and sorry for being a bit longer. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Mario Ravigaloni. All the best for this year's World TB Day as well as UN high level meeting on TB later this year. Well, participants are allowed to pose questions to Dr. Ravigaloni immediately. We already have a few questions for Mario. Uh, Zafar from Star Bangladesh. Thanks, Mario. He says, Thank you, Mario. We have heard new latent TB guidelines have come from WHO. What has changed now? And now is the latent TB pool on the radar of the country programs? Yeah, the answer is, uh, quite, it has to be quick because I don't have time enough, but let me say that the uh, new guidelines that were developed when I was still there uh, are essentially expanding the uh, people that are candidates. Before we were saying only people living with HIV, and uh, with the children less than five. Now we're exposing this to other categories at risk, including those affected by silicosis or on dialysis or taking certain drugs, as well as any contact, not just the children less than five. And then not only that, but the, the new guidelines propose also the use of the short regimen of three months is always even repatenting once a week, which is a major advance. And they don't distinguish anymore between tuberculin skin test 
uh, and uh, IGRA, uh, interferon gamma release assays in terms of diagnosing latent infection, although these are not considered anyway essential when we are dealing with a case of a person that is at particularly high risk. Uh, countries are taking them up. Well, that is the big struggle. We know that in the case of HIV, people living with HIV are put on uh, uh, preventive therapy in an uh, increasing way, although the curve has more or less flattened in the past two, three years. So there is a lot to do, especially for young contact less than five, for those with silicosis, etc., cetera, for, uh, by, by all countries, really, to uh, implement what needs to be implemented. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Vinita Mittal from India, uh, wants to know for renal TB, which diagnostic test should be done? For a kidney tuberculosis, the, the diagnosis can be achieved by culturing the urine, for instance, of a patient, but in reality, it should be suspected anytime there are kidney symptoms, including hematuria, meaning blood in the urine, for instance. And in that case, there are now modern, there is modern technology, radiological or uh, uh, using obviously uh, magnetic resonance and so on, that can allow the diagnosis, uh, at least uh, uh, having an image. In the end, you will need to culture the mycobacterium and find out that it is really tuberculosis and not something else. Thank you. Mario, you spoke about multi-sectoral accountability. How difficult or easy would it be, a, a, according to you, to really achieve this? To bring, to bring different sectors and different departments together. Yeah, I think I mentioned that in my speech. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to achieve because apart from the health sector, we are already, there is a problem in uh, making sure that every minister in this world and every agency that deals with health uh, is truly prioritizing tuberculosis. There is already an, enough of a, of a hurdle there that has to be overcome. But uh, uh, when it comes to other sectors, it's even more difficult. Other sectors do not necessarily recognize tuberculosis as one of their priorities. And the only way to make them understand it is, is to convene politicians at the highest level. That's why I, I keep insisting the UN General Assembly this year, which was our main aim when we even started conceiving the Moscow conference, we wanted to go to Moscow to raise the issue and then from there go to using some of the member states' uh, uh, influence in the UN going to the UN General Assembly. That was the original idea. So now uh, that uh, the TB is at the UN General Assembly, there is a wonderful, unique opportunity to raise the issue at that level, making sure that leaders in the countries, including obviously the prime ministers and presidents, but also minister of finance, minister of agriculture, minister of inter internal affairs and so on and so forth, minister of justice when it comes to prison, are all committed. It's only coming if you have at the highest level the commitment. The example of the AIDS commissions in Africa that have been uh, uh, proposed and maintained and that respond directly to the president or the prime minister is a good example. It's only the only way I can see whereby the head of state can actually take into uh, 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 or, or can, can uh, actually uh, um, be responsible fully for uh, the uh, problem of multi-sectoriality of the TB response. Without it, we are not going to achieve it. If it's back just to the ministers of health, we all know ministers of health are poor. They don't have enjoy enough money to do everything. And so it's really a matter of bringing it to the highest possible level and having a civil society and the voters in the end of the people in democracies, at least, that can put the pressure that is necessary. Not Thank easy, by the way. Uh, Aaron Oxley wants to ask a question. Aaron, would you like to ask your question? Oh, hi there. Um, Mario, thanks for the presentation. That was a really great summary of where we're at. Um, I think. One of the things uh, uh, I'd like to flag to people is that, you know, accountability is something, as Mario has highlighted, that is happening and needs to happen at every level. Um, we recently, at the Stop to Be Partnership board meeting just last week in New Delhi, um, the board uh, supported the development of five headline asks for the high-level meeting coming up in September, one of which was absolutely to support the development of uh, an accountability framework for the high-level meeting that, that includes supporting um, the, this multi-sectoral element of it. Um, there is a working group that, uh, uh, that I'm actually leading um, 
I think, although maybe facilitating is probably a better way to describe it, of interested people that are looking at what this means in detail and in practice and actually uh, developing that and then also figuring out how to turn it into a reality by reaching out to decision makers and building alliances to, to make that actually happen. Um, the deep where that we have calls every two weeks. The next call is this coming Friday at 3 p.m. GMT, uh, GMT um, Friday the 23rd. Um, and if you'd like to be added to the email list uh, and involved in those calls and, and actually doing the work to make this happen, um, please join us. We'd love to have your energy. Um, the person to email to get into that is Rachel Hoare. That's R-A-C-H-A-E-L dot H-O-R-E at results.org.uk. But again, thanks, Mario. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you, Aaron. People like you know what to do because you have been studying this problem. The issue is to get there. And really, there should be no rest between now and September, really maximum possible engagement by everyone. Uh, thank you, Mario. We have a question from Dr. Vijay Chennam Chetty from Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. He says, excellent talk, Dr. Mario. And then he goes on to say that it is well known that tuberculosis is contagious. To end tuberculosis, we have to spread awareness in developing countries like India about cover all cups. This will be a simple and effective method to reduce transmission. Why can't we start a World Cup Awareness Day? Huh. That, that would be a wonderful idea. These are those campaigns that if, uh, if, uh, if uh, they are proposed with a strong push by uh, people like uh, the proponent, and they get to the political level, they may actually succeed in raising the issue and the information about tuberculosis. It's rather obvious to me that the majority of countries in the world, after many years of working in TV, are not fully aware. Their ministers are not fully aware. And I can tell you, UN agency leaders are not fully aware. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really an essential fundamental piece of work that of raising with campaigns with anything of that type. Thank you. Uh, Vikas Rajput wants to know, what is the role of information technology uh, for in the NTB campaign with regards to creating awareness, collecting data, analyzing data? He wants to know the role of information technology. Information technology is essential. When I was at WHO, we issued, over the past three, four years, actually, we have been working on information technology and use of digital tools to uh, help in, uh, in, uh, in the fight against TB. And there are four areas that we uh, uh, highlighted. One is the adherence, uh, patient's adherence to long treatment. And that can be obtained nowadays without having to bother people to walk for three kilometers and 10 kilometers to take buses to go and be seen when they get their drug. We can do it with what is called video observe therapy meaning using the iPhones of these days, we can actually be in constant contact. A good health worker is in con constant contact with the patient asking if he's doing well or she's doing well or bad or whatever. So that is one tool. Another one is for surveillance purposes, as it has been mentioned. Another one is for programmatic type of work, like for instance, uh, having pharmacovigilance in place for those who are uh, taking the new drugs or the new regimens. And finally, there is e-learning, or if you like, both the uh, technical training of people, uh, health workers that need to be constantly updated about TV, and we can use digital tools nowadays, we can use MOOCs if you want, you know, the massive online open courses that can do exactly this type of thing. But also, we could use digital technology to uh, advertise, to campaign against tuberculosis, as it has been suggested already. Thank you. Participants, please keep on sending your questions via the chat function or by raising your virtual hand. Because I think Mario is running short of time. We are very grateful to you, Mario, for finding time despite your busy schedule to be here with us and giving this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mario. Thank you very much. I thank you all and just keep, keep fighting it. Yes. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Mario Ravi. Leone, all the best for this year's World TB Day as well as UN high level meeting on TB later this year. Well, Dr. Ravi Glione set the perfect stage to invite our next panelist who has contributed to the fight against TB in Zimbabwe. Ms. Pedi Mayo, 
Magaya, communications officer at the Union Zimbabwe. It's over to you now. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm standing in for Dr. Christopher Sishiri, our country director who could not make it. We are grateful to you for chipping in. OK, thank you. So I'm going to talk about how we have been working in order to harness political commitment in the fight against TB in Zimbabwe. Uh, you can I interrupt for a moment? Please it's accept okay. your, There is a screen sharing prompt. So you accept that. Then we can share your screen. There you your go. Screen. Yeah. Can you see the screen now? No, no, we can't see it. There must be a screen sharing prompt there. Yes, we yeah, can see I, it. Yeah, you can see it. Yes, yes. OK, that's fine. Yeah. So I'm going to give a background context of our country looking at the TB burden in Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe is among the 30 high burden countries for TB, TB, HIV and MDR TB with our incidence sitting at 242 per 100,000 population. Our TB epidemic is largely HIV driven. The global TB report of 2017 states that 70% of our TB patients are co-infected with HIV. And we have about 20 missed cases annually, which are the reservoirs of sustained community transmission in Zimbabwe. And we believe that early diagnosis and prompt treatment is key in prevention and control. But we all need the money to fight this. But you realize that in Zimbabwe, our funding is largely external. We rely a bit on the AIDS levy, but it prioritizes HIV. It has no dedicated percentage for TB, despite the seriousness of the disease in the country. So we have been working with our policymakers because we believe they are an important stakeholder in harnessing government commitment in any public health intervention. So through support from Challenge TB, we have uh, prioritized parliamentarians to ring face some domestic funding for us from the AIDS levy. So like I mentioned, we do not have much support from the domestic coffers as most of our funding is largely external. So since our engagements with parliamentarians that date back to 2015, we have had some key political milestones that we'd like to share with the world. Uh, the biggest was the launch of the Ulawayo Declaration on TB and HIV and the signing of the Barcelona Declaration. We have uh, about 350 members of parliament in Zimbabwe, and so far a third of them, which is around 138, you have signed the Barcelona Declaration as their commitment in country to end TB. We've also had the parliamentarians publicly screening for TB, HIV and diabetes on World AIDS Day. This happened last year in 2017. We have read uh, the establishment of the National TB Caucus in Zimbabwe. This National TB Caucus was able to feed into the African Regional Caucus, where Zimbabwe is a core chair. So these are some of the milestones that we are achieving through the continued engagements with our parliamentarians and with other policymakers. And at the moment, we are in the middle of drafting a new public health bill to replace the 90-year-old bill that was being used in Zimbabwe. This new bill will take into cognizance issues that are currently affecting our health sector, which include changes in the diseases, the epidemiology, and other health partners. And the milestones that we would want to share with the world is the increase in annual budget for health. Well, we appreciate that in as much as we have not yet reached the milestone of getting to the 15% as specified in the Abuja Declaration, but we can see inroads in the allocation that we are getting from government towards health. And for us, we believe it is a positive step towards reaching the 15% Abuja declaration. And as we are working with the different policymakers, as we are working with the different uh, stakeholders, we believe in the multi-sectoral approach towards ending TB. 
And in that regard, we have also started working with community leaders, the community traditional leaders, councillors, and to date, we had a campaign that we ran last year in 2017, where we mobilized 60,807 community members to be screened for TB. And this was possible through the engagements that we had with the local and traditional leaders. So for us in Zimbabwe, we are currently in the new political dispensation. And we believe with this UN high level meeting that is coming in September, we see it as the biggest platform to raise political priority of TB, believing that our country will be among the heads of states that will attend this meeting. Why? We want Zimbabwe to tackle the triple burden of TB, TB, HIV, and MDR, and increase domestic funding for TB in Zimbabwe. And also, we believe there's need for us to continue working with our policymakers, to continue lobbying our government, to, re to invest more in research and development for TB. Because TB as a disease, it is evolving with every year. And there's the growing threat of drug resistant TB in our country. So there's need for our policymakers to channel resources so that we'll be able to tackle the growing burden of DRA TB in country. So as a country, we believe that we'll we have to continue working with uh, using the multi-sectoral approach, working with the uh, public development partners, working with our policy makers, working with our traditional and local leaders, working with everyone concerned, the civil society, the media, because that is the, this is the only way we can win the fight against TB in Zimbabwe. We would like to acknowledge our Minister of Health and Child Care National TB Control Program, USI Challenge TB, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, and the World Health Organization. For these are the main partners that we are working with, even our members of parliament, these are the partners that we are working with in the fight against TB. Our vision as a country is a Zimbabwe free of TB. So we believe that in these concerted efforts, we'll be able to achieve such a vision. I thank you. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Paidemo Magag Magaya. Before we open the session for Q&A, let us listen to one of the most important voices, voices of affected communities that must be central to health responses. Dr. Zolelwa Sefumba, TB survivor and management committee member of TB Proof South Africa is amongst us. We now invite Hello. Hi. Over to you, Doctor. Hi, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, very well. We can hear you very well. Great, great, great. So, as um, they've said, uh, my name is Dr. Zalelo Sifumba. Um, hello to everybody. Hello to everybody. Thank you for, for allowing me to join this call. I realize I have a short amount of time to speak, so I'll just keep it short and sweet and to the point. Um, so I contracted TB while I was studying to be a doctor. Um, I was studying at the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and I was diagnosed with multi-drug resistant TB. Um, so it was an extremely difficult time where I thought I was going to lose my life. Because um, the treatment is, I'm sure every one of you know, is absolutely harrowing to take and it honestly feels like you're not going to survive through it because in some cases like mine the treatment is actually worse than the sickness itself so in any thinking adult one would think that look I have TB yes and as soon as I started taking the treatment that is when I got sick and that is when I was unable to carry on with my life in terms of studies in terms of work um, and, and, and that the, t the treatment itself is the problem. So it makes more sense to stop the treatment. And the only reason I didn't stop the treatment is because as a medical student, I had the insight um, to the fact that if I didn't take my treatment, that I could develop into XDR treatment. So in other words, the treatment is just super like terrible to take. And it, it, it's not something thing that I would even wish on my worst enemy and the sad thing is that there's still deaths due to TB in this day and age and for me that's unacceptable it's 
honestly unacceptable that TB is still the number one infectious disease killer in Africa. Um, and I really want to use the short time that I'm speaking to call to those that, that, that are accountable, those that said they wanted to end TB in 2035. I, I, I'd really like to call to them to, to actually reaffirm these targets and to say how they are going to make these targets because we are on the ground and we are taking the TB treatment but it, it, it seems to never end and every single day we hear of new people contracting TB and it just it feels like it's not going to end unless those high-end sort of meetings produce goals that are actually going to be reached and goals that we're actually going to see on, on the ground um, and I think my biggest call as well is to just call for patient-centered care where they are they are there's more access to, to, to um, high quality TB prevention services because as we know in South Africa there's a very high burden of TB so um, we're, we're calling as TB proof and as the, the TB civil society that we need more of these services and as I said the treatment is very difficult to take so we're also calling for an upgrade in psychosocial services where patients that are on treatment can be supported through the treatment because there's no point in putting someone on treatment unless they're actually going to see the treatment through and be cured at the end of their term of TB treatment. So we're calling for that. And for me personally, psychosocial service, um, so psychosocial help was the best help in terms of completing my treatment because eventually you start up seeing the end goal. Eventually you're just sick every day and you're not seeing anything happening you know so it is it is key to get psychosocial services to actually help the people going through treatment otherwise there's no point on putting people on treatment also calling for inclusion of people like myself who have had tv who can say that look these strategies maybe it I think we have lost Zoe. We uh, maybe some technical glitch at her end. We cannot hear. Yes, now she's back. I think yes, Zoe. Yes. Hello. Yes, hello. We lost you in between. Oh, sorry about that. And I don't even yeah. know. Yeah, please. please okay, continue. okay. No, I was just closing, and closing and just saying that um, a call to for the people. People. Um, that, that, that have targets, the this, this, um, Sustainable Development Goals, the Moscow Declaration, the WHO NTV strategy, those targets need to be reaffirmed and we need to, those people need to be held accountable um, that we actually see this goal of ending TB. And I think the most important thing for me, which I'd love to see, is for more psychosocial support towards those suffering from TB because there's no point in, you know, putting a lot of funding into developing drugs and the drugs aren't actually tolerable for people. So we need better drugs and we need more psychosocial support for TB survivors. We're funding that is for the people that, 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 that made the goal of ending T TB in 2035, for them to remain um, accountable for the promises that they've made to the people of the communities of the world. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Zolelwa. Yes. Fumba. Well, you you have been an inspiration to us all. Well, that brings us to the end of experts' presentation. Well, we now begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Open session begins right now. Uh, we already have a few questions pouring in. Uh, Padamoyu, you said there is a high TBHIV co-infection in Zimbabwe, and this could be true of other countries. Ong C2 wants to know, what is the IPT status in countries where TBHIV co-infection is high, like, say, in Zimbabwe? 
Are you okay, able so the isoniazid preventive therapy? I, is it being used there? What is the yeah. status? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Yes, isoniazid preventative therapy is being used in Zimbabwe, but most importantly, it is mainly being used for children under five and for people living with HIV. Okay, so uh, are they go are you going to roll it out for the others as well? In India, they they've had just now had this. They are rolling it out for again eligible PLHIV only people living with HIV. But I think we have a long way to do justice to latent TB in other high risk populations as well. So any plans mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe? Yeah, I think plans are underway. This is a policy issue. We need to get the go ahead from the ministry. We need to get the go ahead from government. But plans are underway. OK, thank you. We have a journalist for Philippines who has a question for uh, Zoe. Uh, she wants to know, what about discrimination in tuberculosis? Is it still there? And uh, what do you see the role of counselor? Because you have spoken about psychosocial support. So who are the best persons to provide the psychosocial support? Zoe, can we have you back? I think we have lost her again. I'm Zoe, sorry, yeah. I am having some connection difficulties. No, uh -huh. I'm still here. I just didn't hear the question. Okay, I, I'm repeating the question. There's a journalist from Philippines who wants to know what who is going to provide the psychosocial Hello. support you're talking of. Hello? Can you hear Hello. me? Hello. Hello. Okay, uh, Padamoyu, would you like to answer okay. that question? Yes. What about this? Yes, I can. Hello. Hello. Sorry, it keeps, I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, then uh, we will we will ask Padamoyu if she can answer the question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you intermittently. So what okay. what about the what about the psychosocial support? Who is the best provider for such support for uh, TB patients? And is there still discrimination in the field of TB? That is the question. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Please go on. Hello? Go ahead. Yes. OK, yes. Um, so there is quite a bit of discrimination. Hello? I Hello? Hi, sorry. Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you, yes. but we can just hear this sentence. So can you say something, please? You are going off the air. OK, yeah, the... sorry. So I was saying, yeah, I was saying there is quite a bit of t um, discrimination towards um, people that are receiving treatment for TB, because TB is still seen as quite a dirty disease. It's still seen as something where, OK, you did something wrong or you're HIV positive. So there is still quite a bit of discrimination. And in terms of offering of social support, I think the best thing, the best, we need to train sort of the family members of the TB, the, the people that are on TB treatment, train them on how to support their loved ones. And we'd also need to train the medic staff that actually attend to the patients on a daily basis, teaching them how to become more patient-centered, teaching them about the needs of TB patients, and that when someone comes in complaining of certain symptoms, this is a way to address the problem, you know? So, and we'd also need sort of some qualified psychologists, if it was possible, or social workers, to actually be there and, and, and tackling issues of depression, tackling issues of you know, if they feel that they are going to make it through the treatment and motivating them through the treatment. Um, 
so yeah that that's what i believe okay thank you uh, we have a question from uh, uh, pakistan for padamoyu uh, padamoyu how far has zimbabwe succeeded in involving other sectors than the health or are, is there any move to do that we are talking of a multi sectoral ap approach we should go beyond uh, involving community leaders and community members what about the other departments which are responsible as mario spoke also about them are there any efforts being made in that direction okay thank you so much for the question so what we are doing in country for tb and tb hiv is not to limit partners that are only in the development world that are only in health but we have also opened our doors to parastatals we are so what we are doing we've actually adopted the public private mix where we are working with other partners from parastatals from other profit making organizations that are not really into health so we have continuous engagements with them. Sometimes we offer trainings, sometimes they invite us to their sessions. So this is work in progress. Our idea is to really promote the multi-sectoral approach for we believe it is the only way we can end TB in Zimbabwe. We believe it is the only way we can even end TB in the world. Okay, uh, thank you. Participants, please keep on sending your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen so that we can take up the questions depending on whether you want to ask or write them down. Uh, Zoe, would you like to share something of your own personal experience? Who gave you that support which made you go through that treatment? Um, I hope everybody can hear me. So there's yes. the, the treatment that I, the support that I got were from other TB survivors. Um, so TB proof is made of quite a few TB survivors. Some people have had MDR, others have had XDR, some have, um, have had drug sensitive TB. And we, 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 we do our best to kind of draw in other healthcare workers in the Western Cape and in South Africa at large who are going through treatment. So we have quite a, big network of people who have been on treatment, people who are on treatment. So those people offered me so much support. People like Delene von Delft, people like Patricia Bond. Um, these are all TB survivors, MDR TB survivors that are part of our, you know, part of TB proof. So they were the ones that supported me the best because of course they had been there before. Okay, more questions, participants. There is a comment from Aaron Oxley, and uh, he wants to share this email. I'm just calling it out R A C H A E L dot H O R E at the rate results dot O R G dot U K as the person to contact to get involved in the accountability work. He has made that comment. We have an, another comment from Dr. P.S. Sarma, a noted physician in T, of TB from India. He says, role of NGOs and professional bodies like uh, medical associations, etc., is an important item in our endeavor to end tuberculosis. Would any of our panelists like to comment on that? Hello. Hello, yes. Yes, could you kindly repeat that so I can comment? Yes, he says that how important is the role of NGOs and other professional bodies like uh, medical associations, uh, etc., in our uh, efforts to end TB? Okay, thank you so much for the question. So looking at our um, context here in Zimbabwe, where we do not receive much support from government, you realize that it is the NGOs that are actually pushing the TB agenda. So we believe they have a critical role to play in so far as 
our efforts to end TB are concerned. And uh, looking at the medical associations, TB is quite clinical. It's actually highly clinical. And there is no way we can work on TB without involvement of the medical associations. So I believe the NGOs, the medical associations, have a critical role to play in so far as efforts to end TB are concerned. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Jameson uh, Malemela for Zoe. Uh, Dr. Jameson says, hi, Dr. Sifimba. Did our social protection legislation help you? I mean the compensation fund in RSA. Sorry, please repeat the question. He says, he asked, did the, our social protection legislation help you? He means compensation fund in the RSA. Oh, no, I wasn't compensated at all because I was a medical student at the time. Um, so there is Uh, we cannot hear you, Zoe. We have lost you again. Compensation for employees that are doctors and healthcare workers, but there's nothing at the moment for medical students. So, no, I wasn't compensated. All right. Uh, Victoria uh, Gemelia wants to know the contact which I had called out, could it be provided by, uh, share, by sharing it in writing with the group after the webinar? Yes, of course, uh, Victoria, we will share the email shared by Aaron with the webinar recording to all the participants. So no problem about that. Uh, there is a question from Govinda Roka on the role of civil society to end TB. Uh, would Padamoyo like to say something on that? OK, of thank you so much. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, I believe like what I've already explained uh, concerning the role of NGOs, we also believe that uh, the civil society organizations have a role to play in ending TB. Currently here in Zimbabwe, we have established the NTB partnership, which is being spearheaded by the civil society because they are the ones that are really in the ground they are the ones that are working with communities. They are the ones that are interacting with TB patients, ex-TB patients on a day-to-day -day, um, on a day-to-day -day situation. So we believe if they have the proper tools, if they are armed with the right information, if they get enough support from the government, they have a serious role to play. They are our connection between the patient and the government. They are our connection between the patient and the health facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Padamayu, there is a very specific question for you from a journalist from Zimbabwe, Catherine Movia Kufa. She mm -hmm. says, in Zimbabwe, we have Mount Hampden, which is a farming and brick making concern 20 kilometers west of the capital city. The community's mm -hmm. life expectancy there is 60 and less. TB infection by nature of life is very high there. So are STIs and HIV infections. Can Zimbabwe map Mount Hampden as a high risk area, which is in dire need of services? The little clinic there does not even have paracetamol syrup. So prevention awareness is required in this community. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for that uh, question, Catherine. Uh, what we are currently doing as a country, we have a project that is called Active Case Finding of TB Among High Risk Communities. We have done a mapping exercise where we listed a number of high risk communities and we have had um, outreaches that are being done across the country. We have had some that were done in that area last year, but we are going to have more that will be done this year going forward. 
So we, yeah, we take into cognizance the issues that are there in Mount Hampton. They also apply to other um, cities. They also apply to other towns. We will be visiting those team, those areas, offering screening for TB, offering our services through outreaches. Thank you. We now come to the end of this webinar. My heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists and participants for taking part in today's webinar and enriching it with their valuable inputs and active engagement. Special thanks to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease for helping us host this webinar. As you already know, you. the webinar gets streamed on YouTube and, and podcast links will be shared with you and made available in public domain very soon. And lest we forget, World TB Day is on 24th March and a good time to remind ourselves that ending TB is everybody's business. We need to focus on building commitment, not only at the political level, but at all levels. All can be leaders of efforts to end TB in their own work and sphere. Bye and have a good day. Thank you.